to batter down. Why did the fisherman get caught in the surf? How is this famous tennis player aced? What knocked these three sportsmen out of competition? There are more ways to die than the human mind can imagine. Some are sudden and shocking. Others are slow and methodical. But every death, no matter how strange, can be explained. Even the most curious and unusual. Polo Grounds, New York, August 16th, 1920. Meet Ray Chapman of the Cleveland Naps. For eight years, he's been the team's go-to shortstop. In the infield, he's known for his hot glove and a quick arm. Strike one. In the batter's box, he's hitting 278. Pretty average. Tonight, Chapman faces Yankees pitcher Carl Mays. Mays is a world champion four times over. And a big part of Mays' success is his distinctive submarine delivery, which according to baseball physicist Alan Nathan has some unique properties. The old adage is that the knuckles just about scrape the ground. The natural motion for an overhand pitch is to give the ball backspin as it rolls off the fingers. If I flip the ball around, now the natural motion is for the ball to come off with top spin. The submarine pitch releases the ball low to the ground, sending it on an upward arc. But top spin pushes the ball down. The low release point, the initial upward trajectory, and the top spin motion of it are all things that a batter is simply not used to seeing. Strike two! But May's submarine delivery isn't the only thing that puts a special spin on his pitches. Carl Mays was very adept at surreptitiously scraping the ball on the pitching rubber, creating a scuff mark. In the hands of a skilled pitcher, a ball with a scuff mark on it can be made to swerve in a rather unpredictable direction. Well, predictable by the pitcher, but certainly not predictable by the batter. Because a baseball has a smooth surface, it travels evenly through the air. Any scuff mark will make the ball's surface uneven and the airflow around it turbulent. The ball now breaks in unpredictable directions. In August of 1920, the scuff ball had just been made illegal in the major leagues, along with another gimmick pitch, the spitball. That doesn't mean that people did not use these gimmick pitches. It's quite possible that he did actually throw a spitball. A spitball itself has its own peculiarities. Peculiarities that make the ball just as unpredictable as scuffing it. When the pitcher put saliva on the ball. What he's doing is he's lubricating the surface between the fingers and the ball so as to reduce the amount of friction. It's that friction that results in that spin of the ball. If now he's lubricated his fingers, the ball's going to have less spin on it. Less spin means it's not going to drop as fast. Whether it's a scuff ball or a spit ball, May's delivery makes it impossible for Chapman to anticipate the path of the pitch. Even as he goes in for a bunt. And perhaps he thought the ball was going to curve at the last minute and go over the plate. Ray Chapman didn't even move. In fact, to me, it almost seems as though he lost his concentration. He didn't make an attempt to get out of the way.
The pitch hit Chapman directly in the temple. Chapman died 12 hours later in a New York hospital from blunt force trauma to the head. His time in the big leagues didn't result in a trip to the Hall of Fame, but a curious and unusual death. the Texan go from fishing on the beach he's sandwiched between the sand below him and the truck above him to being buried beneath it Crystal Beach Texas May 23rd 2005 this is Tom Buckley Lewis a Texan who loves to fish. The Gulf of Mexico holds treasures for a fisherman like Tom. Walleye, kingfish, even barracuda have been caught in these waters by fishermen casting from the shore. But tonight, the fish aren't biting. Instead of packing it in, he decides to catch a quick nap and ends up under his truck, safe from the elements. But Tom's short nap turns into a long slumber, and the low tides start to rise. A force of nature controlled by the awesome power of the moon, according to astronomer Mike Reed. Anything that has mass, anything that has material substance produces gravity. And the moon is a pretty massive object, so it produces quite a bit of gravity. That can actually dramatically boost the tides. The moon's gravitational force pulls on the planet and its waters. The ocean closest to the moon begins to bulge. As the waters bulge, the tides rise. So every 12 hours, you're going to see the oceans come up and then go down, and then come up and then go down, twice a day. Tom wakes up from his nap into a nightmare. This high tide is now reaching his toes. which triggers a deadlier problem, quicksand. Help! When sand and water combine, you get what physicists would call a non-Newtonian fluid. You get a substance which um, sort of behaves both like a solid and like a liquid. It can allow things to start to sink into it. Things like Tom's truck. It has now sunk 13 centimeters into the sand which comes as no surprise to physics expert Lou Bloomfield. A little water actually firms up the sand. It's actually sort of stronger than dry sand. But if you keep adding water to the sand, it stops being wet sand and starts being sandy water. Help! Tom is now trapped beneath his truck. The tides undermined first the rear wheels of the truck and then the front wheels of the truck and the truck settled into the sand on top of him. But he's sandwiched between the sand below him and the truck above him. For Tom, it seems like it can't get any worse. But it's about to. Because tonight, is one of the few nights in the month when high tides grow even higher. How did the fisherman go from sleeping comfortably under his truck? He picked the day when the tides were at their strongest to being buried beneath it. Uh. 
Unable to catch any fish, Tom Buckley Lewis thought he'd catch a few Zs under his truck. But when the tides rose, Tom's truck sank in the wet sand. He's now pinned below it. And what he doesn't know is that a bad situation is about to get a whole lot worse. Tonight, these high tides will reach their extreme, all because of the moon's position to the Earth. When the sun, the moon, and the Earth are all in a straight line, they work together to create especially large tides. It's called a syzygy, and Tom is about to learn firsthand its awesome power. A syzygy happens bi-monthly when the sun, moon, and Earth all line up. The sun's gravitational force combines with the moon's gravitational pull. The bulge caused by the moon's gravity and the bulge caused by the sun's gravity coincide. You get a super big bulge, and it have especially strong tides. During a syzygy, the tide can double in size, raising its waters an extra meter. If you weren't expecting that, you wouldn't necessarily know that the tides that day were going to be a little higher than usual. Tom begins to lose the battle with the force of these extreme tides. He picked the day when the tides were at their strongest. Now, he's not just trapped, he's drowning. As the water rises, he struggles to breathe. until the high tide completely submerges him. He holds his breath, but within three minutes, his involuntary nervous system forces him to breathe. And he will breathe in water, causing death by drowning. The sad case for our angler is that that was the, the tides of the day and he couldn't escape. The next morning, the police arrive on the scene. It's all yours, man. Assuming the truck had been abandoned, they ticket the vehicle and take it away. Oh, my God. The grisly discovery is made. Tom Buckley Lewis had set his sights on pulling a trophy fish from the Gulf of Mexico. But what he caught instead was a curious and unusual death. the famous tennis player. You don't even know that you're getting slightly woozy and that you're actually getting a little bit unconscious. Dead. Southampton, New York, September 17th, 1994. This is Vetus Gerolitis, and tennis is his life. In the 1970s, he won the Australian Open and the doubles title at Wimbledon and routinely gave legends like John McEnroe and Bjorn Borg some of their toughest matches. Of course, during this game, things are a little stacked in his favor. It's all in the follow through. You lose all your backspin and your power when you don't follow through on the swing, okay? because this is not a professional game or player, but a sponsor who has given money to charity to get tips from a master. You uh, coming to the party tonight? I never miss a party. Not only an athlete, but a playboy, 
Vitas loves a good party. And tonight, the party is at the million dollar home of a real estate developer, a resident scenester who's lending Vitas a place to stay in his pool house. A perfect spot for a pre-party afternoon nap. Or so he thought. Less than a meter below is something that is about to end the tennis star's good times. A pool heater, which according to heating technician Steve Quinn, is more powerful than your furnace and hot water heater combined. They are running in around 250,000 BTUs. When you get into that size, they consume a lot of fuel and they need a lot of air to burn properly. And fresh air is in short supply in this pool house basement. It's just the amount of air that they consume is probably the biggest concern or reason to not put a pool heater in living quarters. That's why installing a pool heater requires strict guidelines. If it's installed indoors, it must be in a sealed room that has fresh air directly connected to it from the outdoors. That heater must exit out through the wall or up through the roof to get rid of the products of combustion. But this pool heater is three inches short of venting outside. As the heater burns, it spews carbon dioxide and water. Neither is dangerous. But if carbon dioxide has nowhere to vent, it gets sucked back in. And that's when it turns lethal. When you take carbon dioxide and you reintroduce it into the burning process, the carbon breaks down and you end up with carbon monoxide. So now you have a recipe for disaster. Vitas is not sleeping in the basement, but he's about to start breathing in the toxic air. When the air conditioning system kicks in, the intake vent pulls up the gas from the basement and delivers it directly to where Vitas is napping. And now the whole space, wherever this ductwork is, is being filled up with this poisonous gas. And according to Dr. Peter Lin, he would have no idea that he is starting to breathe in deadly fumes. Even if he was awake, he would have probably not been able to detect the carbon monoxide. You can't really smell it, and so therefore you don't even know that you're getting slightly woozy and that you're actually getting a little bit unconscious. As Vitas falls deeper into unconsciousness, the carbon monoxide starts robbing his body of oxygen. In our body, we have hemoglobin. That's our red blood cells. It's like a shuttle service, so it brings oxygen from the lungs and it brings it to your tissues. The problem with carbon monoxide is that it grabs onto the hemoglobin and it doesn't let go. So therefore, you cannot deliver oxygen and you cannot remove carbon dioxide from your body. So effectively, you're suffocating. This pool room is now at 2,700 parts per million of carbon monoxide. That's over three times the lethal dose enough to cause convulsions and death. At those very high levels, he would have probably not lasted for very long. All of his little hemoglobin would have been bound by the carbon monoxide, no oxygen going to the brain, no oxygen going to the heart, and he would have had an arrest. There's no way that he could have woken up. The party went on without Vitas. The maid didn't discover his body until the following afternoon. Mr. Carolinas, sir. An autopsy will reveal that 75% of his blood is saturated with carbon monoxide. Vetus Carolinas was dead due to carbon monoxide poisoning, proving that no one can return the serve of a curious and unusual death.
sports. They can be more than just games about winning and losing, but life and death. So if life throws you a spitball, you'd better learn to duck. And that if you go fishing under a full moon, don't get lured into depths you can't handle. And a little rest may prepare you for the big game. Just don't sleep too soundly. The baseball player, the angler, and the tennis star all devoted themselves to their favorite sports, never realizing that the final score would be a curious and unusual death.